Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of MGR Unplugged. I'm here with David, and uh, this week um, we're trying to stay away from the coronavirus um, topic, but we're going to just uh, talk a little bit on the lighter side and how our lives are changing and uh, some of the things that we're doing as we are either in mandatory or voluntary confinement and staying a little more in our houses or in our offices uh, versus just doing our normal life. So um, let's get started. None of you people can tell me to stop. Lower the lights down, hand over my crown, hand over my heart, I do this for my town, I do this for my crowd, so turn me up real loud, my time, my time, none of you people can tell me to stop. All right, so uh, David, I actually have a quick question for you. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny because I've been thinking about this for the last, you know, especially the last week. I think it's when we've seen things getting a little more serious with California just last week, uh, basically went into um, a state of alarm or confinement, which affected a lot of the business and people that we know. Uh, obviously, New York is in in very um, uh, dire stress situation. Governor uh, Cuomo is constantly in the news with uh, how difficult the situation is there for people in New York. There's a highly very dense uh, population there. But um, as far as our lives, um, what do you think has changed mostly, uh, like, for example, in your normal habits of uh, daily habits or how you live your life? Now, obviously, work is different. We have a lot of things. But in your personal life, uh, how are you adapting to this uh, new uh, situation? I mean, pretty much everything has changed, really. I mean, I think that's true for everybody. I don't think, like, just everything, little things, you know, like, and I think a lot of people can relate to this where it's like you have little habits that change. So for me, it's like, okay, you know, I've been making coffee at home now because I used <laughs> to go get coffee. Okay, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I'm a big basketball fan. So especially this time of year is like basketball prime time. Mm -hmm. There's no basketball. And it's like such a reflex for me to be like, you know, because especially I like to work at night. So I'll put on a basketball game while I'm working or something. And I'll multiple times, I, I don't do it now. I'm over the hump now. But for the whole like week after they canceled the NBA season, I was like, I literally would like reach for my pocket, be like, oh, what games are on tonight? Oh, there's no games on tonight. Yeah. And uh, little things like that. I mean, just everything. And then obviously work is much more disrupted uh, just because I think everybody's kind of in limbo right now. And, and you know, one thing that I was obviously, uh, I think most people, obviously, for the people who work non-essential jobs, uh, not to say that we are not very important people, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, we, you know, we're a marketing agency, so we're not an essential job, right? right? right. <clears throat> um, and I'm sure, you know, most people out there don't work essential jobs. Obviously, there's a lot of healthcare workers, grocery, et cetera. Um, and those people are doing great work. But obviously, the majority of the people don't work those jobs. And I think for the people who are not working those jobs, this is just a good time to kind of reflect yeah uh, i agree and think i mean i it's funny because it's like this is the how many things we take for granted uh normally oh, yeah. especially us i mean oh, in yeah. the, i'm talking us as being in the u.s that we have a certain lifestyle that other people don't have and now when we're when our lifestyle is interrupted and affected so severely as far as our social life connections and everything else and things that we can do uh, it, it really affects us like little things like even going to have a cup of coffee or watching an NBA game you think you're looking at things that are more for us whereas you go to other right countries. and I don't want to say like I'm complaining like okay my problems oh right. there's no NBA big whoop obviously I'm fine okay I'm not complaining but yes it is just different it's just like all of a sudden overnight all of the little habits you have change you know before now every morning before every morning I used to wake up and check my email first thing that was always my th my first thing oh, I'll pull up my phone and check my email now mm -hmm. I actually check the stock market first thing instead <laughs> of my email so li little things like that you know um, but yeah I think everything's changed what, one of the things that I've noticed too and, and I'm similar to you as far as my normal habits obviously have changed and, and this is like in the news and, and it's like a, I mean, I hate, I normally don't watch news, honestly, because I, I think news is always bad news. It's just um, somebody said the other day, CNN is the crisis news network or whatever. I mean, it's, it's like everything is breaking news, red bands, everything. The, and with this coronavirus thing is, I think it's 50% pandemic 50 percent fear induced media that just wants to portray 
I mean, headlines that don't make any sense. Well, you know, I think I actually I was talking with someone about this the other day, and I think that a lot of this, the reason why people took so long to react to the coronavirus uh, was because and I blame the media for this in a sense that it was like it's like the boy who cried wolf. The media makes everything look like a big deal. Right. And that's their business. They make everything. Right. <clears throat> breaking news is the biggest story in the world. So that when there finally was something where you really should be ringing the alarm and saying, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Pay attention. Because people have been hearing that for so many years when it wasn't true. It's the boy who cried wolf. But, it, but it's just, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes you like to look at the positive side of things. And I'm not saying like hiding the truth or anything, but... Unfortunately, we live in a in a world where the internet and the news media and the clickbaits and all that stuff rule, and that's how they get more clicks, more advertising money, more revenues, more visitors, and so forth. And and, and sometimes you start looking at the headlines, <clears throat> and you see the headline which is really negative, and then you click on it, read the article. <clears throat> excuse me, and the article really is not that negative itself. The article is just explaining yeah. everything, but they extract the only negative part of the story to put it on the headline. Because see, they say things are going better, people may not click. Uh, like, like they say, for example, they say, the number of deaths are, are expected to increase over the next few weeks. Okay, well, that's just logical. Unless people that are dead come alive, the number of deaths are going to increase over the next few weeks. I mean, that's just a stupid headline right there, okay? And they're never going to decrease. Now, if you start clarifying, say, the percentage or the ratio or something like that, but they say the number of deaths are expected to increase over the next few weeks. Well, yeah, it's always going to be the case. I don't care if you have coronavirus. People are going to add to the people that are dead already, okay? So we have 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. I expect it to increase, okay? But then they're actually saying that in the article, they say, well, but the recovered cases are also increasing and this, and we started to see that some countries are reaching the peak and all that stuff. Okay, why don't you put that on the headline? Because they always pick the bad news. And I don't care which side of the spectrum you are in politics or whatever, even if it's a news, uh, a press conference or something, they always pick that line that you are in theory not lying, but you're skewing, skewing the story into the one that is going to give you the more clicks. And um, believe me, you were talking about habits. Every morning now, I'm actually reading newspapers from Spain to see what's going on there, newspapers from France, newspapers from England. And when I say newspapers, obviously, I go to the, to the online, to the internet versions. And uh, I think obviously the US. And it's interesting because it's something that is across the board. I don't care which media outlet you read they all are focusing on all the negative aspects of this yeah and there's silver linings out there that was, are good and good stories but nobody actually they put them at the bottom lower left like a little article saying oh this person actually did this or recover or this person did a good thing or well i, I you talk about the globalness of it i i forget who said it someone said it the other day um but they basically said and at first it sounds like oh that's not true but it is true when you think about it that this is probably the biggest global event that has happened since World War II. I mean, really, World War II was ended in 1945. Since then, has there been a, a there's been big events within countries, but within a like globally, where there is nobody who's unaffected right. by this. Has there really been an event? I don't think so. I think this is the biggest global event that's happened in a century, basically. Yeah, not not in recent memory for sure. And and the way, uh, not only that. I mean, this is an event that is has come like a tsunami. I mean, like we were. Uh, I mean, I I it's remember. It's an event that. No one alive today has lived through something like this. Right. So right. that no one really knows how to navigate this. There's no one alive today who was <clears throat> alive in this 1918 Spanish flu, you know? So right. um, it, I think people don't know how to navigate it. And I also think that people, uh, I think that there's some groups that are completely in denial. And I think there's other groups that are completely like, way over exaggerating mm -hmm. and i think it's somewhere in the middle i think people who are in denial thinking that oh this is going to be eight weeks and then back to normal 
I think they're lying to themselves. They do that without any fundamental knowledge of what is going on. Uh, they just, I, I think some people that are in denial, they do it like a psychological yes. theme for they themselves. Don't wanna, people don't like bad news. Right. Like they, they psych themselves to say, oh, this is nothing, this is nothing, just to kind of get motivated, like a motivational tool for themselves to say, it's like everything else is not going to be this, but uh, but it is. It is. Um, but that's, that's the thing. Like, I think it's 50% the truth of the pandemic that we have global, as you as the name in, implies. And the other 50% is more uh, the fact that we are now watching more news than ever, reading more stories than ever. We'll get into Twitter and Facebook in a little bit, but... Uh, um, all those things are like, that's all we know. There's nothing else to look. There's no sports. There's no other news. There's no uh, culture. There's no history. There's nothing. Everything you see is about that. Every email you get is somehow related to that, whether it's a company that right. you work with or a company that you're a client of that is telling you their, policy, their, well, their philosophy. Even with us on this podcast, I, you know, I was like, well, I don't really want to talk about it because we've talked, I mean, especially us because we've been talking about it for... This is like the third or fourth week that we do it. Yeah. No, but I mean, we did podcasts in early February about it. And I was writing yeah. in my newsletter in January. About yeah, we were it. So talking about it. it's been like, for me personally, two months of talking about it to where now I'm like, okay, I'd like to mix it up. But the truth is, there's just nothing else to talk about. You but know, I, like I, 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 we send newsletters and it's like, okay, am I really giving e-commerce tips right now? Like, do people give a shit? Is that what matters yeah, right no, now? Yeah, I mean, people's you minds know? are other things. But, but that's my thing. I mean, we were talking, I asked you at, at the beginning what have you how, how are you seeing your habits changing and to me one of the things that i realized is how how fragile we are really i mean yeah in, oh. in, as a society and as the world i mean we've have evolved so much in the last specifically in the 21st century i mean if you discard 1900s whatever well i think from 2000 think let, me, let me finish for a second the, probably the 70s on we've seen globalization like never before right right in the 70s is when basically the u.s 60s 70s was when the u.s lost all its manufacturing and so it's basically been 40 50 years right and i'll let you go ahead but this has been the last 20 30 years have been peak globalism i think that we'll on the macro side perspective i think that we'll see a shift away from globalism because of this i think that we're going to go back to localism Probably a lot of nationalism in a lot of countries. But honestly. I wasn't just talking about the global versus local. I'm talking about how much the world has evolved technologically and everything in science and everything. Yet this virus that originated in Wuhan in China in a matter of whatever, whenever you think it started, what it was 30, 60, 90 days ago, has basically invaded the entire world and interrupted the entire world. And all these scientists that are at the top of their game for everything else, they're still racking their brains trying to figure out how to fight it. I mean, the vaccine, we know, is not going to come for like, who knows, a year, year and a half. But even the patches, the methods, the this and that, and how unprepared we were for this situation. And I don't care. And this is not just the U.S. or whatever. It's all the governments. I don't care. I mean, it looks like Korea did a better job. China, who the heck knows what they did and or they didn't do and they tell us or not or whatever. But every other civilized country for which we have reliable information is on the same boat. I mean, we're now, in theory, maybe a week or two behind what is happening in Europe. But in Europe, their cases are like all over the roof. I mean, Spain is pounded. It's actually the second after Italy as far as cases, deaths and everything else. And more than China, by the way. France is following up. Yeah, if you believe it. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, if Germany. If anybody doesn't think that China has millions of cases and they're not reporting it. Yeah, well, I know. It's just you have China too much faith in the but, Chinese government. But England or the UK is, is basically starting to. I've seen the lockdown already in London. I'm thinking of a confinement. No, no, I mean, too. even India. So, India, yeah, a country exactly. of 1.2 well, billion right, people right, right. shut down so, the whole thing. So, day. Olympics cancel. I mean, Tokyo is now having, or Japan is having new cases. Is this a global thing where you think, how in the world these countries that are the most industrialized countries in the world are being affected by this thing that in theory you think, okay, they should have just been able to just shut it down right away affected some people and do whatever yeah, that's, circuit breaker we have for health issues that yeah, but, boom clutch it we have that for the market we have that for many of the things we have that for war we have that for mm, but you're over terror situations you're over uh, of, of course i'm oversimplified but no, I, I, I like i said when we spoke about this in early february i said we need to be shutting down borders now and we didn't do it but 
It's because shutting down a border with a country is not something that you just do, okay? That has massive trade implications both ways, especially, and now in, in the U.S., excuse me, we'll probably start seeing borders shut between states, and that's never happened before. Right. Uh, and but that's so the only you, way you can have a real But you can't quarantine. just say, oh, were we unprepared? Yes. Did, was... In a situation of pandemic, do you need to be proactive or reactive? You need to be proactive. And every single governing body, including the WHO, which is their whole job, they're supposed to be apolitical, uh, a-national, basically, not uh, aligned with any country. Even they fucked it up really bad. And so that basically, I, I do think if trust in government and institutions wasn't already low, I think this has deteriorated in well, even more. It, it, I think has, I think trust for government officials is like I said it wasn't even high to begin with but it is at all 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 time lows because this is the one case you know or not the one case but one of the few rare cases where having a centralized authoritative uh body is good because they can act very quickly on a nationwide scale and globally they failed at that. Globally. Well, one of the uh, one of the good things of this situation is that I think uh, I was listening to another podcast the other day, and I forgot actually who was the person. I wish I could give him credit, but uh, it was the first time ever that we know of that all scientists and medical community and researchers from all over the world are actually looking together for a solution to this or a cure, basically for the virus. Um, there's never been a situation where you have more cooperation now between Europeans, Americans, Japanese. I mean, basically people from all over the world pulling together efforts and research and sharing information as far as what can we do that is uh, short term, as far as testing, solutions, medicines and things like that. Uh, middle term and obviously long term as far as vaccinations and how we can solve this issue. So that's a, that's a positive thing that there's, you know, like back in the days when you have Russia and the U.S. or the USSR and the U.S. cooperating for some of the space programs and maybe going doing some things together or the European Space Agency with Euro, with, with the U.S. and all that. And now we have uh, the whole scientific community is, is cooperating, uh, I mean, truthfully into this situation. So hopefully that will open these channels to to work in the future, you know, to make sure that this doesn't happen. But yeah, well, I mean, to me, it was it was incredible to see how, you know, you expect, okay, yeah, it's like, I don't want to minimize things, but saying, okay, yeah, this, this affects like malaria, things like that. Okay, this affects third world countries or kids or, or families or countries that don't have developed situations. And we have all these programs to help him with vaccinations and this and that and hardly ever gets to civilized countries. That, I just think it's remarkable that besides basically a couple countries like maybe South Korea, I mean, across the board, especially in the Western world, US, Canada, Europe, Australia, all these, well, I guess, I don't know if you call West, Australia Western, but whatever. Uh, I think you get what I mean. It was like a, across the board failure. I mean, literally, there were, I don't think there's a single European or North American government that did it right at all. No, that's the thing. That's, that's how, the that's my point. Thing. That's how unprepared we are with all the top civilized countries. We have this, the, the G7s, the G8 summits, and the discuss. We had the Davos conference right at the beginning of the year, and they were talking about this too. And this is the top scientists and governors and, and uh, personalities and powers of all the world discussing how the economy and everything is going to progress for the following year. The funny thing about Davos and, is that they weren't, this wasn't, well, I don't know, at least on the public side, obviously Davos is very much a backdoor dealing type of event. Right. So I don't know what they were talking about behind closed doors. But as far as the public conferences themselves, they didn't even discuss coronavirus right. implications at all. They were talking about growth projections, GDP projections, all those things that are like nobody at Davos was saying, hey, guess what? In Q2, GDP is going to shrink by 24%. Listen, nobody was saying we, that. And again, this is not political, but we as the country or even the president underestimated this. We basically Everyone thought... Everyone did. Exactly. We, uh, we, we Still, I mean, fucking Florida. I, yeah, yeah. That's... The, the governor, the, the political leadership of Florida, especially Florida, which, by the way, has a very high uh, uh, older citizen population because lots of older people like to retire go and retire there. Yeah. The entire uh, 
suite of officials in Florida should be sent to fucking jail for what they're doing. <laughs> they're such crooks. It's so unbelievable what they're doing. And it's it's not just Florida. I'm picking on Florida because that's been that's a case where they have probably the most vulnerable uh populace of any state. I mean, I don't know which states have the most old people, but Florida's got to be one of them. And it's just been unbelievable how poor and even still, I mean, it is March 20, what, 26th? And they're still not shutting everything down. It's unbelievable. Yeah, you, you said something before about um, shutting borders. I mean, I, I, um, I, unfortunately, I think that's the solution because... Yeah, at this point, you have no other solution. I mean, like, like for example... We're in Arizona, obviously, border with California. The traffic between Arizona and California is constant. I mean, it's just a constant. People of Arizona that work in California do business there. California people do business in Arizona. I mean, it's constant road traffic, airplane traffic, whatever. And Arizona was actually with few cases compared to the rest of the nation for a long time. Now we're starting to creep up. But um, we were basically low cases. And if this... Uh, possibility of crossing borders existed, I mean, Arizona could have really said, okay, listen, we have our neighbors that are sick on the West Coast, and then we have people that probably in Vegas have already shut down all the casinos and all that stuff, and they may come back here or whatever. We're going to shut our borders. We're going to basically shut the border. Know, with, the problem with that is that's completely unprecedented. It it's is. It's literally never but happened. They, all these things Except that for we're maybe doing, civil war, well, but that's never happened where you can't just cross I borders. I know. Well, the whole coronavirus is unprecedented. The situation we have now has never been, has never existed. Not in the modern and, world, no. No, Not exactly. In the, global, well, I don't know. in the globalist world that we have now. Well, exactly. No, Everybody, every government and every nation is taking unprecedented measures. I mean, I don't think Spain has ever been in quarantine for like four weeks that it's going to be now, or France, or Italy. I mean, that's never happened. So it's unprecedented. So the U.S., is a huge country, and right now we don't have a national emergency situation as far as locking down or confining the entire country. But we're at the mercy. Well, we have. I mean, basically, shut all our borders. Yes, the borders to, to external traffic, yes. obviously. But uh, but we don't have a confinement nationwide, like shutting down the country, saying okay, nobody leaves their houses. No, and right. I think at this point, I mentioned to this. We were talking the other day. But, I, but what I was going to say before is is the Arizona thing, or basically any other state. I think I think it's a genie's out of the bottle. It, the cross the closing borders between states now means nothing because it's, it's in late. every state. It's too late. Yeah. But you know, it, it's like if you have a big ship container, whatever submarine in, or something. When you have a, a a place where basically you get a torpedo and you get something and water comes through, you have compartmentalized the, the ship. You can close a section of the ship so that section gets full of water, but the rest of the the cruise ship or whatever kind of vessel you have continues to navigate that's in sync. So if you consider that with the U.S., you can shut down and quarantine and close the borders or certain states that are safer and then leave the ones that are more infected or affected um, quarantine until they heal it up, but instead of spraying all over because unfortunately you have all these flyover states, which they're called that for a reason. You have the East Coast. You look at the map. You have the East Coast is totally red. The West Coast is red. Started with Washington, and now it's California but stuff. But it's everywhere. And right then, now. It's well, red. exactly. Now it's getting everywhere. But you have states like like uh, Iowa, Des Moines, Montana, whatever. New Mexico have very few cases. Arizona have very few cases before, and now they're starting to spread. Why? Because there's more mobility. If we have been able to quarantine on a state by state and lock down the states, you say, okay, yeah, we have four problematic states in the US with a lot of traffic and but people. The, pr the problem and is then by the time you have problematic states, it's too late. It's already everywhere. You just don't know it yet. Because well, it's, it's too late when you don't act quickly. But No, because even by the time Washington, which was the first one to have an outbreak, by the time Washington had an outbreak, it was too late. It was already in the rest of the country. We just didn't know yeah, it but yet. We were because talking people travel constantly. Okay, so uh, unless you shut it down when there was like five cases, it's too late. If you wait until, oh my gosh, there's 200 cases in Washington, it's too late because it's already spreading everywhere else. No, you because just don't it's know easier it to yet. control where those cases came from. In Washington, there was like a retirement community or something and, and some kind of situation that was very um, specifically isolated there. That's why they grew so much in Washington, which is not a common place for a population density. It's, well, I mean, Seattle's pretty dense. Uh, yes, but it, it wasn't up. in Seattle. It was Spokane or some other um, region. Uh, but it, it, regardless of the but case... But you don't need... 
that's the thing. This virus is highly contagious. You don't need to be in a super dense area to get it. Any suburb, it spreads through. Suburbs are not dense like a city, but it still spreads like wildfire. It spreads, but social distancing is where it's curing or preventing. Yeah, but no not one curing, was social distancing. The, right. I mean, a, a situation like in New York is much more difficult to have social distancing. We, we there. started social distancing four weeks too late. Well, I know. Basically. That's the point, that we started too late. I think... I think when you start seeing the situation and you have enough information about the coronavirus to see how contagious it is, and everybody knew that it was very contagious, they say it's not as lethal as the H1N1 and all that stuff, but it's very contagious, and it could be lethal for different populations. That stuff we knew from, from the beginning, and then we just let it ride, you know, like saying, oh, it's, yeah, it'll be fine, whatever, and then it was too late. So, anyways, that's... that's Let's get back to what we talked about originally. Yeah. You asked about... Uh, <clears throat> day-to-day life you know i wonder and i wonder what other people are thinking too because uh you know this is typically a business podcast but all business has been disrupted really uh i personally and i'm always someone who errs on the side of action i always feel like oh i need to do something oh let's do something let's you know whatever in any normal circumstance and in most circumstances that's the right move right because there's too many people who talk and not enough people who do Mm -hmm. and so opting for action is normally the best choice but you know we're a company we have we had to have our own kind of strategy meetings because it's like okay what's the roadmap here and you know and i said it i was like honestly right now There's things that I'm thinking about. And you ask, like, I've just been reflecting a lot and quote, not literally meditating, but quote unquote meditating where like, I mean, I'll just sit in silence for a few hours or work, work meditation or walk, go for a walk or something for an hour. Just no music, no podcast, nothing. Just think. Um, And there's ideas and there's possible courses of actions that I think could work. But the truth is, I just think there's so much uncertainty that even though I'm someone who always is like, oh, let's just go, go, go. I'm like, maybe we should just kind of hold off for a minute because making a hard decision now or setting a specific roadmap now, I just think is stupid because you don't know what's going to happen. And I think a lot of people are feeling like that where I hate the feeling of, I, I hate feeling complacent. Like when I, when you, when you feel unproductive and you're not doing anything, but at the same time, I'm like, well, you know, this, if there's, it's not complacency, it's just kind of patience and waiting it out a little bit. You were talking about the movie, uh, Braveheart or no. Yeah. 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 I was joking. (laughs) Hold. Yeah. Hold. If you haven't searched, just search up uh, Braveheart hold scene. Um, I mean, what do you think? I mean, no, I I agree. agree. I'd be curious what other people are thinking too. It's just, uh, yeah, I have ideas and things that we could do, but at the same time, it's like, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Forget a six-month roadmap. I don't well, know what's going to happen so in six days. Know, I, I, we never know what's going to happen, but I think it's more no, but the fact that we're not in control. For example, companies, even all the public companies that are reporting numbers right now, they all said, we're not giving any forecasts. Well, yeah. Where they yeah. said, we, we have no idea. We're not going to give any earnings guidance, nothing, you know, right. and this, the, which is rightly so. And because, again, remember what we discussed. This is not an economic crisis. This is a health crisis well it's both and, it's well both. Uh, yes and now it's both but it started when you have an economic crisis you start seeing like signs of things are not look that look too good but they're not really that good the biggest but the, question the health is, crisis is that the health crisis has become now an economic crisis we're gonna get into the stimulus package and all the stuff so now this economic crisis that all the companies are being affected one way or another it's like, yeah, but our books actually were fine. We were actually having good reports and we were reporting uh, above expectations up until last quarter. But now I don't know if the next two quarters are going to be worse. They know they're going to be low. So it's impossible to make predictions. You know, it's just not. Right. And that's why when I say I think now is the time to be kind of reflective and just really think about things before people commit to action. If you're a non-essential, obviously if you're in an essential healthcare or whatever, yeah, go, go, go. That's what you're supposed to do right now. But if you're in a non-essential uh, uh, service or product company, um, I think now is a time to more be reflective but- because we don't know, the biggest question is not the health part of the crisis will be solved at the very most, probably within six months, at the most, hopefully sooner, right? I think everyone understands that. It's the economic implications that we don't know. We don't know, are we going into a massive recession? I know. Are we going to bounce back? So that's why I think just blindly saying, okay, this is our strategy, go, I think is not no, no, smart that, right that now. No, no, that would be nonsense now. But let me ask you as a business person, 
you know, one of the things that business people, entrepreneurs, CEOs, whatever, do companies is trying to anticipate what's going to happen in the next, you know, I mean, uh, I always remember Bezos saying, when we look at a quarterly report, it's for something that we plan like a year ago. We're not planning for the next quarter or the next quarter. What we're seeing today is for something that we planned actually a year ago, and now we're seeing the fruition of those plans, whether they worked or not, and then moving forward. So you're always trying to anticipate and plan ahead as much as possible. Right. But, but I'm saying that you uh, can't really do that. No, right. I understand. I understand. But my point is, if you try to learn from this situation and become better in the future, how do you do that? Because this is not something that you can really prevent. Like if I'm, I'm a business owner and we are really very close to companies that are all over the spectrum, but specifically restaurants are being pounded very hard. Some of them will not even make it. Some of the hotels. Some, a lot. Well, exactly. Yeah. It. Some hotels that were just totally uh, doing very well just up, up, up until a month ago or even projecting for the spring and the summer and all the events that they had planned now are actually shutting down and totally projections out of the window. Airlines are the same way. And we had a long discussion last week. But any other business that is really doesn't have much power to make changes to, to whatever this affected or however this affected them, I don't know if you can anticipate this situation other than saying, okay, well, we're going to have always this emergency plan for whatever happens that we can implement. And then we are quickly able to change directions and say, okay, well, we have these projects, whatever it is that we want to get to, they're not urgent, but they could be filling time in times that we need to be working more on ourselves yeah, versus with clients. When you say projects, what do you mean? Because well, for I know example, what you're saying. Like we have internal projects that we work on when it's like, okay, we don't need to work on clients. If maybe we can't. But those are often not directly revenue generated. I understand. We can do them because we're not in a, as tight a position as our restaurant is, okay? I understand. But a restaurant, well, that's there's I'm nothing saying. they can do. That's they need point. revenue. That's exactly my point, that I don't know how every business can be prepared for a situation like this. Like if I own a restaurant, on my restaurant is packed every day, happy hour, whatever, we have a lot of things, and then this kind of store is screeching hold for whatever reason. I mean, you can handle maybe a weekend that there's an accident or something, they close the road, the only access to your restaurant, and all of a sudden you see traffic that people decide, oh, we'll go to another restaurant. Fine, that's a weekend, whatever. But this situation, we're shutting down your restaurant, basically. And people are not going anywhere. So how do you prepare for that? Or what do you do? Uh, like some of them are very, very creative and saying, okay, well, hey, we're shut down, but you like our food, we can deliver it to your house and we're going to do this and we have all takeouts and all that stuff. And that's fine. That's a plan. I mean, you know, if that's the plan they have and people are fan of that thing, but in some cases you can even have takeouts. I mean, there's not even option for that. So, so far here in Arizona, we can, but in other places, they can even do that. They can even deliver stuff. So either you say, okay, I'm going to have all these savings in place. So maybe if I was planning to remodel my restaurant, in the fall, I can do it now. Nobody's remodeling a restaurant right now. Well, I know, I know. But They're using the that money to uh, pay people if they can, pay their rent. Because the thing that, especially with restaurants and hotels and things like that, that I think a lot of people don't understand is like, even if they cut all their staff and cut all well, the yeah, food expenses, yeah. the biggest expense for a restaurant is the building basically Under overhead. is the lease. Yeah. And so even if they cut all their staff and cut, they obviously aren't buying food and all of that, they still have a huge lease and they can't cover it. And like, you, like you said something about Cheesecake Factory. That, yeah, like Cheesecake Factory and basically that's a major said, this is, yeah, they have chain. hundreds of stores. And they're not actually a cheap restaurant either. I mean, no. And they basically said, uh, we've already notified our landlords basically, hey, we're not gonna be able to make rent on April 1st. You know, and this is not, if there's a, if there's a restaurant type, it's the chains that should be more safe, but a lot of them are in trouble too. Right. Um, I, but, but is that is that is that poor planning on the restaurant or on the on the when you're a side? bigger when you're a bigger chain like Cheese Factory, yeah, because we haven't even been closed right. that long yet. Cheesecake Factory, I would hope, has more than three weeks of cash to survive. Um, now, yeah, obviously, there's. Now, I wanted to mention one thing when we were talking about the virus and the shutting things down. I do think one thing that is very dangerous that is happening right now is that, you know, there's, I mentioned, maybe we can, well, maybe we don't have to pull up, but we can maybe put in the show notes. There's this uh, 
chart or graph that was going around that is basically a timeline of weeks without cash flow that companies can survive uh, in, yeah. in typical sectors, basically. And it was saying, okay, the lowest is like restaurants. Basically, if they go literally a few weeks without money, they just go out oh, of yeah, business. Oh, yeah, the average restaurant, uh, two weeks without but, shutting down. But it was they- basically within two, three months without cash flow, a third of U.S. companies are just out of business, especially small businesses, mm-hmm. are just done. Like companies don't have three months of savings, basically. Well, there's there's a whole. And so to finish, I think what we're doing right now is really stupid as far as policy in terms of. I think we're half-assing the quarantine because in Arizona, for example, we're not locked down. I mean, we businesses are closed, but I can go right now, go to a grocery store, go to a gas station, go to things like that without much precautions or procedures. Well, you're talking business are closed. Uh, but not a restaurant s- business. And right, restaurants like and stuff. Okay. But, but um, I, I mean, I see it all the time. I see pe- parks we're are not, packed. We're not in confinement. We're not on lockdown, full basically. lockdown. Right. And the problem with that is that we're... Ha- we're feeling the terrible economic hit, but we're not totally smashing the virus at the same time. And I think that's stupid because what that means is that the difference between, let's say an eight week lockdown and a 12 week lockdown. So if you half ass it, it takes 12 weeks. If you go all in just full quarantine, maybe it takes six to eight. That difference, if it takes an extra four, six weeks of lockdown where all these businesses are shut down, that is... So it's over, basically, because here's why. A lot of people, I think, don't understand the complexities of economies where, like, I see a lot of people saying, oh, well, landlords should basically give people, not make people pay rent or whatever for the next two months. Okay, that's nice. If the landlord is like an independently wealthy person and they own the building or whatever, own the property, and they can afford it. And I've seen some landlords do this. That's nice. That's very nice. And they should do that if they can afford it. I think people of means should be helping others right now. But most landlords are not a person. It's a big company. It's real estate investment trust. It's these companies who, by the way, they don't own the building. Okay. It's no different than a person who has to pay their mortgage. Right. You're yeah. paying rent. <clears throat> they take that money. They pay uh, maintenance, mortgage, all of these things, staffing, all of that property management, all of that. And they have their own mortgage to pay. So if you don't pay them your rent, then they can't pay the bank their mortgage. And then all of a sudden that ripples down. And if all of a sudden all of these basically property companies, these real estate property management manage, companies yeah. can't pay their mortgages on the rental properties, then you have a banking crisis. And that's when things really hit the fucking fan. Because all of a sudden we have a 2008 type thing where everybody's defaulting yeah, on their... I mean- on their homes and their properties. Yes, but at the same time, as we said last time. But what I'm saying is in six, eight weeks, maybe that doesn't happen. If this goes 12 plus weeks, yeah, it's going to turn into a banking crisis. Yeah, obviously, obviously. That's the danger. There's no productivity. The GDP, which is the domestic product, which is how much the country in each country produces, basically the value of the country. If the country was a factory, that's how much the country country produces as a country, you know, in, in goods and services and everything else. So the more you have this factory stopped, meaning the entire country coming to a screeching halt, the more the GDP suffers. Therefore, you go into, it's like a domino effect trickling down to anything. Right. I don't care if it's you not paying your rent or your owner not paying your rent because, not paying his rent because you don't pay your rent to right. him and so forth. He just kind of scales down and then, oh. But but again, we start from what we said last time, that this is not, this didn't start as an economic crisis. In fact, the country was in pretty good shape financially except for your count, content. Um, but I think that's not true. No, well, that, that's fine. We I don't want to repeat I will, I'll tell everyone, listen to our podcast from last week. Right, right. Because we went into the economic implications. And basically, my two-second r- summary is this recession was going to happen within the next couple of years anyways, but this accelerated it and made it drop like that. Basically, yes, uh, but I, I also my party analogy. Yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's, that's just I don't want to go. All right, go to listen to last week's episode, yeah. and we discuss. And it. I, you know, again, uh, but I wanted to um, go back into because the other the other aspect that we're not uh, thinking much or I don't see much about is the psychological aspect, and we are 
and I, this is not just us in the U.S., but every every person in the Western world is is very we're used to socializing. We're used to going out. Whether you go out on your own and you're a person that just likes to go to a bookstore and sit down, have a coffee, read a couple of books, or, or go to your coffee shop, or go shopping, or even go to the grocery store without a mask and gloves and chat with people there and see who you run into or to the park, we like to go out. And people can be home told, hey, don't go out for a week, maybe two weeks. But now we're getting into three weeks, four weeks, possibly six weeks. I know that a lot of people are going crazy, just literally. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people where... It comes to a point, and this is actually true already in some countries, where people say, fuck it, I don't care if I get coronavirus, I'm going crazy in my house, to the point that I'm being totally depressed, and I'm not doing anything, and I'm just going to kill myself. Seriously. I mean, then you get into serious depression problems where people are like, I'm totally confined. And we are in a nice apartment or, 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 or house or whatever in the in the U.S. is a little more suburban living in some cities, and you have your house maybe a pool whatever is fine are this is, is <clears throat> are the suicide stats true because i always i know i well let me tell you because i <clears throat> always have heard that and i've always believed that that okay in economic downtimes that there are a lot of basically a lot of people kill themselves but actually i was reading the other day someone showed the statistics and they said actually no more people commit suicide in good times than bad times because in bad times People go into survival mode, adaptive mode, and everybody's doing bad. Basically, there's nobody right now who is like living some awesome life. You can even it's funny because even Instagram, which is always like the very showy thing, mm -hmm. when I go on Instagram, everybody's the same thing. Everybody's like, I'm so bored at home, whatever. I'm nobody's living a showy life right now. And actually, that suicides are higher when times are really good I'm because not... they compare themselves to others and they think that they live a shitty life. That, no. That's what I've seen, <clears throat> actually. That's that's the yeah, that's the uh, the uh, over factor. But in this case, we're talking about just regular people that are. Um, I mean, some people were comparing this to like a nursing home where older people are basically put there because they need constant care and families are all over the place. They cannot be with their father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, whatever. When they get older, they put them in a nursing home. They're supposed to be taken care of. But that's basically like the saddest thing you can see. You've never been to a nursing home. Oh, I know. I know. Um, that's like... If I ever get old, I'd rather just die than go I know. To a well, home. no no other person wants to go there. They try to make it very nice and all that stuff, but basically just run it by people that are like... Forget if you you are like an active person doing your life and you have some kind of medical condition that requires constant attention and you're lucky enough to even go into a nursing home with the costs associated and all that stuff. I mean, the life there is basically anything but exciting. You have the same routine, you're going there, blah, 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 blah. So now you have a lot of people that are very proactive, that want to do things and they are in, in their houses and they're not seeing the little couple of things that they make him happy in life and they do it for one week, two weeks, three weeks and they just go into a state of total psychological disarray. I'm not saying they're going to kill themselves i mean hopefully not but what, what there's going to be a lot of a fallout from from that situation when you start thinking is this is this cure that we're trying to impose or solution worse than the actual problem it is or just basically saying there okay i get infected or whatever obviously the, the problem is that we're already saturated the, the hospitals are saturated so what do you think about what do you think because this is a problem that people don't talk about and i don't necessarily have an answer what about what do you think they should do about prisons uh, what about him in terms of basically there's outbreaks having in, in prisons and everybody's super confined and stuck in jails and prisons what do you do i i actually was thinking about that i think uh first of all i don't know how the prisons got or the prisoners got infected unless the guards get it vis they have visitors right because once so, it gets in a prison <clears throat> yeah it's very very it's gonna spread right right obviously um Honestly, I don't think before, if you're talking about the um, the rights or whatever, I mean, people are confined in prison just like they are in their own houses. So I don't think they should do anything with that, confine those people. Obviously, the person gets extremely ill and needs hospital attention. Uh, that person should get the hospital attention. But like, they, have, they have that kind of thing yeah, but within I mean, their prison, prison too. Yeah, but they're basically saying the risk is that the prisons could be, I mean, you could have everyone in the prison sick, basically, in a matter of a week. And but then, how sick? I mean, not everybody that is sick dies, obviously. Well, a lot of people don't even have symptoms. I mean, we discussed this, but I mean, the, 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 let's say the the percentage, the, the well, death rate or whatever. Well, do you is think that 1%. they should, which some people are proposing, uh, like 
that personally, if you were to ask me, I would say, okay, anybody who's in there for a violent crime, sorry, of you're course. stuck. Uh, anything that's like a serious crime. But for all the people that are in there that committed petty crimes, yeah, misdemeanor, are in there like for that. maybe yeah. they have a two year, three year sentence, things like that. Do they deserve the same punishment as someone who's no, no. in there for life? I, you I mean, know, uh, this, those are just very uh, moral type situations. Yeah, but say, this okay. is a real life example. Well, it is. Where you have in the U.S. hundreds of thousands of people who are in there for petty well, I mean, misdemeanors, uh, listen, things I like mean, that. In my opinion, if you're in prison and you have a life sentence, fuck it. Okay? No, I'm not talking about the life sentence. Okay, so, I don't care. Someone's in there for murder. Okay, and well, I don't care. If you're 50 and you're sentenced to 25 years in jail. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. So I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about someone who raped someone or killed someone. I don't care about them. Okay, so misdemeanors. So, yeah. Okay. Say you're in jail right now and you have a three-year sentence. Right. Do you deserve the same? What if you die in prison because of coronavirus? Well, no. Nobody should die in prison. I mean, I, I, if it could happen. I mean, what if the prisons get old? Prisons are no different than the outer world. In fact, they're, they don't have unlimited hospital beds in prisons either. They don't have the Obviously medical not. capacity. I, I think uh, if, if, a, if a person that is in prison for a theft, misdemeanor, whatever, that is sentenced to two, three years, and the person is severely ill, like like a normal person out of prison that is that is, is supposed to go to an emergency room, that it cannot be just put two weeks in quarantine or whatever, yeah, that person should be just taken care of. I mean, I don't think... But what if... But should they let people who have, let's say, like a three-year or less sentence, should they let them out? If the, if the hospital doesn't have... I mean, if the prison doesn't, doesn't have the facilities, yeah, they should be... Like let free? Uh, not free. Or temporarily, basically. What do you mean free? They go to a hospital and like they're still... let out of the prison, basically. To go to a hospital. Yeah, or to stop the spread in prisons, in, in jails. No, 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 no. If uh, That's what they're discussing. Okay, well... If I mean, I, that's what they did. No, They've I mean, done that in other countries no, already. No, prisons have different options for confinement of people that they can be separated from the rest of the prisons. I mean, even, even now, when you go to a normal clinic... They have separation between people that come with some kind of respiratory disease, probably coronavirus, but they don't have versus capacity. the person that comes to the clinic because they have a cut or they broke their arm or whatever. So even a normal clinic that you and I may go to, they say, hey, if you have uh, any respiratory thing or anything remotely related to coronavirus, you come and come through the back door, be isolated, mask, gloves, everything. We're going to treat you there, but you're not going to be in touch with the rest of the uh, Sick patients that we have that are here because they have. All right, but what if you have a uh, what if you have a jail with a thousand prisoners and all of a sudden two hundred of them need to be in the ICU? I mean, they don't have well, that type of capacity at a prison. No, no, no. Is you saying two hundred? I mean, first of all, ICU is the extreme case for everybody. Okay, even hospitalization. Okay, they don't have that capacity. No, obviously not. So, so if, if let's say that the prison population. I mean, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about prisons, but. Uh, if the prison population, you have a 1,000, and it's the same demographic print as the normal population where you say, okay, well, we have X number infected, X number of the infected people or cases are mild to a little more severe, to extremely severe, to basically ICU people, then, you know, if you have people that progress so badly and then they need to go to ICU, they go to an ICU like any other person you know, provided that they have space like everybody else in the normal hospital. So, but majority of cases, depending on your age group and all that stuff, but are they do perfectly something treatable. Just because you have coronavirus doesn't mean a death sentence, okay? No, no, no. But should they do something proactively? Because that's the thing. Once it's in the prison and it's spreading, it's fucking everybody's going to get it. Well, yeah, they should do, I mean... But should they proactively... Uh, do something. I don't think or a prison... Or they say, fuck it, they're in prison. No, no. I mean, I don't think a prison is different than a workplace. I mean, or, or an MBA. Right, but all the workplaces are shut down. Right, exactly. Prisons are not. Well, but I mean... How do you shut down a prison? Well, you can, you can separate... Like I said, you can create different... Uh, prisons, like I said, they have different So now sections. everybody's just on isolation so they're just stuck in their cells or not allowed oh, yeah. to leave their they, cells they basically put them in isolation even in isolation within the prison they have different sections they can have the east wing of the prison for people that have symptoms and the other one for people that don't show symptoms or separate them no visitors allowed no contact food this the way I mean they can do the same thing that we do outside of prison it's really um uh, you can consider a prison like a hospital a hospital has a lot of patients some of them may be coronavirus patients some of them are not 
but they still need to separate the patients and the, that are one thing versus the other, the doctors that go with one patient versus right, the other. Right, but that's the problem that's happening in hospitals is that it's spreading like crazy. Okay, well, right, no I know. No matter the precautions. So, so, but I don't see much separate, much differentiation there. I mean, if a person was there because he has a, uh, a misdemeanor or a two-year sentence or something, that, that doesn't mean that they're going to leave you died. I mean, uh, you cannot do that by law. Okay, or even morally. It's I mean, it's not I don't care. that they let you die; it's that they get overwhelmed and they can't treat you. But that's happened outside of prison too. That's what's happening everywhere. Right, but should they take preventative action before it spreads? Well, in prisons? of course, everybody should take preventative action. I don't care if you're in prison; or you are in everywhere, anywhere, anywhere in society. Every nucleus you have, whether it's a prison or whether it's a playground or whether it's a whatever, should take preventative action so that cases don't spread. So that's just that's just normal. I mean, uh, I don't see that. I mean, you're asking me, oh, okay, well, we have a guy that is a rapist and he's not that no, sentence. No, no, I'm not talking about that, obviously. Okay, well I then, don't care about the guy who raped someone right, when I was in prison. Exactly. Sorry, okay? okay? But I'm talking about, <clears throat> you know, like the majority of people in jail are not murderers and rapists, okay? Right. The majority of people did one stupid thing and maybe they're super remorseful and regretful and are trying to rehabilitate and get yeah. out. Yeah. So, so they deserve a, oh, fuck you, fate, basically? No, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, like I said, if I have symptoms of coronavirus, the first thing I'm going to say is, okay, yeah, you are a positive case, um, stay home for two weeks. They don't send me to the ICU or nothing. They say stay home. I take um, a acetaminophen or whatever they give so you. So they just lock everyone in their cells. No one can go well, to the yeah. yard. No yeah. one can leave. But it's not different than locking down. I'm locked down in my house. I know, They're but a cell, cell is different than a house. It, it doesn't fucking. They're in jail for a reason. Okay, well that's their that's their thing. Or well, no, I don't want. I wouldn't say it's different than a house. A but cell. A, yes, of I course. mean a cell is literally a bed and a toilet, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, that's fine. So what? Do you want to leave, or it's you like want to get in a closet, basically? Well, yeah, but they're in a cell for a reason, so that's their punishment. Your confinement instead of being I in know, your but. maybe two bedroom apartment in New York, and you can't even leave your your house or right, anything, enough, versus enough. being in a cell. Okay, fine. You got sick. So you're no no visitors, no contact with other prisoners, and stay in your cell. And then that's it. I mean, I don't see there's a risk. With Do that. you treat people on priority based on their? Uh uh, crime other oh, crime yeah i wouldn't say their crime i'd say so mostly you have two people with coronavirus one's in jail for murder one's in jail for theft do you treat the theft person first if you have limited i'll say depending on the on the on the scent um, yeah if you kill somebody that's a whole different thing that's what we're that's talking what about I'm saying yeah of course if you kill somebody then yeah i'm not gonna be taking care of you the same way as the guy that basically shoplifted whatever and went to jail but that guy is not next to each other the guy that killed somebody no, I know, is probably for a fucking like yeah, I know. obviously there. there's nuance there's right i don't know what they're doing in maximum security prisons of course of but, course uh, i mean if if i'm 50 and i have a 40-year death sen life sentence okay well i'm gonna spend the rest of my life in jail so guess what you are not a priority right now we're making that selection no matter what even in civilian life or freedom life with between older people and saying. younger people so there's always a natural selection hey listen we only have one respirator so if you are 85 i'm gonna have to give it to the guy that is 55 and has more lifespan ahead of him sorry i just need to do that i mean it's just that's happened all the time people get all these things that oh my we're being selective stuff that happens all the time you know, if you're crossing the street and you can only save one person and you see a grandma carrying a little baby across the street, you're going to try to save the baby and not the grandma. Sorry, I can only save one. OK, that's that's just what it is. I'm talking AI. AI will do the same thing. You know, talking about artificial intelligence and you're driving your car and the robot decides who to run over. Those decisions need to be made. OK, so uh, at some point it's a natural selection, you know, and the virus actually is making the natural selection itself because it's affecting older people more than younger people. So in a way, that's kind of a good thing for this virus, because if it was affecting kids and children and babies, that would be a fucking bad virus too. But it's affecting people that are older as far as the mortality rate and with a pre-existing medical so, condition. So the, within all the bad virus conditions, I'm okay if people that are, uh, of course, are putting our grandpas and grandmas to a more risk, but at the same time, if the virus is being a little more selective and 10% of the deaths or more 
or actually no, in, in, I, I know in Spain, 90 something percent of the deaths are people that are over 65 smokers and with some kind of pre-existing conditions. Okay, well, we've been telling you forever that smoking is bad for you. So now you're actually seeing why, because you don't have defenses. Yeah, but what to, about people who are just old? That they're not, they didn't smoke and drink, they're just old. That's fine. Okay, they're old. Okay, so their they're immune you system. To or, die just you're the, old? Nobody deserves to die. Okay, we're not talking deserving to die. We're talking about people that are older and therefore their body is not functioning anymore at 100%. If you have a car and it has 200,000 miles, that car. It's going to perform okay in normal thing, but you put it in a steep hill, more likely that engine is going to fail. Okay, why? Because the engine has 200,000 miles and it's like old and fatigued and no compression, whatever. Whereas the other car that is new is going to go with no problem. I mean, that's just what it is. Okay, so the virus is, is affecting older people because they're older, basically. Their body is already but what's, in a stage. Yeah, we know that, but what's your point? You think we should... Say fuck it, only old people are gonna no. die, so we should reopen everything. Or no. what do you think? No, you I'm saying? not saying that. I'm saying that. Well, first of all, this started with the prisons and stuff like that. But as far as the we can move on from the prisons. But what's your point about the old people? Obviously, yeah, okay. It all no, my old point people, with the old people that. is that the virus is affecting mostly older population. Yeah, and then that's just the fact. So if you're talking about, we should try to save every single life. Okay, right. But that's what's, number one. What's your point? I'm saying. No, you're asking me about selection, whether we should select prisoners or not. And then I said the same thing about the older people. I said in the normal life, we're always making a selection. Hospitals are always making a selection, okay? If you have an emergency room where there's a bus that just went into a wreck and they bring 30 people there, uh, it's the same thing. Why do they say always women and kids first, blah, blah, blah? Okay, they say for a reason. I don't know about the women because they sometimes get upset. But you always try to save the children first, okay? Because they have more lifespan. That's just... Just as normal life. Every father will give their life for their children. Why? Because they say, okay, I'll fucking live already 50 years. No, I get that. I'm, I'm okay, well then, w that. the point is that older people, if there's only limited resources... Yeah, I get that. That's what they're doing. So that's what they, the point. That's the point, okay. basically. I know. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm saying... Okay, whatever. Um... I mean, let's, the bottom line, line is that this situation is actually, unfortunately, going to kill... Um, or this virus is going to um, affect older people more than younger people, and it's already affecting older people more than younger people. And like I tell, I mean, uh, it, why is Italy more affected? Because the average age of the population there is older. In Spain, it's the same thing. Majority of people are people that are in nursing homes or older people, and they also, you know, heavy smokers, conditions, asthma, whatever. Their lungs are already affected, so they are more very, very sensitive to any kind of. I mean, they could have got pneumonia, and they got the coronavirus instead and it, it may kill them or it will kill them, okay? So those people, unfortunately, are at higher risk. So, yeah, is the virus discriminatory and, and, and affecting more older people? Yeah, but if you have a virus that is affecting younger kids, I'll be much more upset. It's not well, that yeah, I'm not course, upset. Of course, but, I, 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 I think know. I said that in a podcast a couple <clears throat> weeks ago. I said we're fortunate, and right. I've heard many virologists say that. In this case, normally viruses hit old people and kids. And in this case, kids seem to be for the most part fine. Right. So we're fortunate in that case. Right. But for whatever reason, they're not so, I mean, there's younger people that are also affected, but those are the minority. And when you look at the mortality the, the rate, rate of kids is not high. At yeah. All, when you look at mortality rate by different age groups, and that's pretty steady across the board and <clears throat> across the board, meaning across the countries. But you can see that <clears throat> for, um, Older people is like 10, 12% very high. And Italy is almost there. Like the global rate in Italy is like 8%. But then when you get to the 50s and 40s and 20s and 30s and so forth, then it's just more normal to the point that it's like less than 1%. So so, <clears throat> so back on the question that you asked me originally, mm -hmm. I'll throw it back at you. How are you uh, reflecting and kind of, are you planning anything or are you just kind of waiting it out a little bit? I'm well, just trying to a see little, what happens. A little bit of both. I mean, I'm I'm um, definitely reflecting. That's what I said that I, I was surprised how <clears throat> there's different things that I think every day. One of them is, like I said, how fragile 
these superpower countries are. I mean, we're the most... But forget about the but let me, global. Let me I want to talk po- about you more. Well, that's my reflection, basically, is, is saying, at what point do you feel safe? Like, you rely on all these you governments, you know, to... That's, I wouldn't. I think people should <clears throat> well, not rely the on thing. the government. It's the same thing. It's, it's no different than, okay, well, they, just, they just passed this um, stimulus package with the government to help. I know we're going to get into that in a second, but we all pay Social Security with every paycheck, okay? Whether it's bi-weekly, monthly, whatever your paycheck is, you're paying your contribution to Social Security, which in term, in term means that um, when you retire, the government will pay you back, will give you some money, uh, a monthly payment based on your contribution. So, okay, but now the government is telling you, well, that's not guaranteed. You're paying this thing, but they say, well, we may run broke or whatever. So we're always relying on the government for certain things, whether it's for healthcare or for this, or for Medicare or Social Security or keeping us in peace or keeping the roads built or, or whatever it is. We're always having these government institutions that we pay for directly or indirectly via taxes or fees or whatever, and you trust that they are going to do their job. And to me, the reflection is like, they are not doing their job. They definitely didn't do their job now. Even in this right, case. Did, <clears throat> so did it refl- really take until this for people to realize that? Well, I think in the in the in this situation, yes. Um, but um, my reflection is like you need to start being more responsible or more critical, and then take care of yourself much more, as far as financially and be secure and everything else, because you know that the government may not always be able to help you. And, and, and sometimes even the way they help you is not the way that they think they're going to help you. Like, what, they're trying to put this package now, and I went to get into the stimulus package that was just approved yesterday, and um, they said they're going to send um, um, $1,200 per individual. And actually, they're going to go back to, I think, two years, uh, 2018 tax return, basically. So obviously, they don't have the numbers for 19, which the deadline is now push back 90 days or something. So they're going to go back to 2018 returns to determine who gets what and how much and so forth because there's a limit where it phases out. But anyways, the point is they're going to pay 1200 for in, per individual, 2400 basically double for couples, and I think it's 500 per kid. Um, <clears throat> so in theory, any average family of four with the parents and two kids will get a free check for 3400 bucks. Okay, that's great. It's gonna help. It's a lot of money, by the way, for to send that to everybody. You know, uh, I think the limit is seventy-five thousand dollars of uh, adjusted gross income by per individual and uh, one fifty uh, for couples. But, anyways, I don't know how that phases out. You get some, some or part or not. I, don't, I haven't seen the details yet. But that's basically the gist of the of the government assistance or aid. So you get the money. And um, yeah, that's gonna help. I mean, if if you basically were unlucky to be laid off or full or yeah, something, yeah, depending on where you live, it'll help more or less. Yeah, obviously, cost of living is an issue, but they they cannot go by that. I mean, they just need to do something across the board. So right. yeah, some people in New York said, okay, this doesn't pay shit for me, and some people who live in Des Moines, Iowa, whatever, in the middle of nowhere, they might say, oh fuck, they pay my whole rent for the year, you know. So, and and that's. I don't know, okay? <laughs> but, I mean, the, the bottom line is that it's, it's, it's some money that is going to come in the mail. And some people say, okay, that's not... Um, in some cases, like Bernie Sanders was about to um, basically vote against it or not approve it because he said that they also extending unemployment benefits by $600 to whatever you are already entitled to. Like, if you are laid off, you are entitled to unemployment, whatever rate applies to you based on your contributions and so forth. But now they say we're going to increase it to uh, buy $600 no matter what for like 60 or 90 days that you get extra money. And then the complaint was like saying, okay, well, for some people that might be too much money. It may actually promote unemployment because some people may say I'm getting more. It's happened before. It's not the first Is time. 600 bucks? No, in addition to your normal unemployment. So what's if, okay. Uh, is that per month or what is that? Monthly. Yeah. So, so uh, maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're a minimum wage employee. Yeah. It depends. It depends your level of where you live, I guess. Right. Exactly. So if you not normally get like, let's say $600 of unemployment, okay. Uh, a month. And now on top of that, they give you another $600. 
that's 200 and you may say i'm not going to find a job for 200 bucks a month right now so i'm just going to file for unemployment and stay three months basically not working and doing this so anyways that was one of these situations so they they now try to have a, a supervisor that is going to check obviously when you go into unemployment you have to comply with certain situations looking for a job for jobs yeah you need that, to yeah. basically be actively looking for a job but they say that you know everybody trick, tricks the system they set up Truth interviews is right now it's okay say you're a server and that's your right. career or whatever uh there's nobody hiring servers so it's like i don't even know how you tell how do you apply for jobs if there are none well but that's the other thing that unemployment only applies for people that were employed not to freelancers or right. the gig economy right. people and all that stuff so you were a freelancer you are basically on your own. That's 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 the, why the freelancers need the twelve hundred bucks exactly more than exactly anything. because if you're not officially a W two employee in the U S. or be, uh, an employee. This unemployment thing doesn't apply to you. If you are a freelancer. You are basically supposed to put money aside and then you live on a. Now, obviously, the difference is if you're a freelancer, you also don't pay employment taxes. So that's yes, or unemployment taxes. So you don't you don't pay that. That if you're a W two employee, you do. So obviously, the idea is okay. You don't pay these taxes, but that means you're saving money, so you should no, need it. No, when you are, yeah, you're not paying. No, the the the, the employees never pay unemployment taxes. Well, okay, the employer yeah, pays I know, them for you. But obviously. That gets into semantics because uh, this is one thing that you and I discuss and that I think a lot of people don't understand. If a, So if companies have a certain budget allotted for employees, obviously, you know, because people think of it like, okay, this is my salary plus healthcare plus right, right. social security, payroll, all those taxes, right? Uh, unemployment is part of that. So if a company has 120000 to pay someone, Maybe your salary only ends up being ninety because the other thirty is another right. Expenses. Right, you have another budget. So the idea is, if a contractor, you don't pay it because basically, like you've said, it, it it's insurance. It's not a tax, so to speak. So if you're a contractor, you're supposed to save. Now, obviously, a lot of contractors, freelancers, gig workers, it's not like they're making yeah, so the, much the, to save. I, I just wanted to say that the the package includes a lot of things, and we're not going to get into all the details. But basically, the main thing. Do that you think people, it'll be enough? Well, we'll see. I mean, or do they, you think they'll do more? They, 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 they said that maybe they will expand it to two months, uh, depending on how things recover. But obviously, that's just one portion. I mean, they're also allowing people to uh, uh, complete their tax uh, returns 90 days later, in, which means that if you owe money, you can also delay 90 days. They're also allowing people to forgo some of the uh, payments and things that they have. A lot of banks and, and credit cards are also allowing their customers to delay mortgage payments and things like that. So hopefully, things financially, at least people that are hurt, hopefully, like you said, for 30, 60, 90 days, will have a little bit of a breather to say, okay, I get some cash from the government to begin with and then if I get my job back or everything goes back to normal I'll be able to get back with my normal billing and everything else if it's a, a 60 to 90 day situation but you're asking me how it affects me personally well this is what I was leading into it's like now I mean I don't want to rely on the government to bail me out okay I mean fortunately I'm not in that situation I don't need the bail from the government or anything like that but I, at the same time 95% of the population needs that kind of is in that situation where they say, okay, well, they pay to paycheck. Not 95%. Okay, 90%. I don't know what population is, but uh, the, uh, uh, when you read the statistics, they tell you that a lot of people, a lot of families cannot afford an emergency for more than $1,000 without having to break into some kind of credit card or putting themselves in further debt. Okay, they don't have the cash to say, okay, yeah, I need to buy this for a thousand bucks. Yeah. Okay, so we can look at the numbers. It doesn't matter. But the point is that, you know, it, if I were a person that actually says, you know what, I'm a good citizen, I have my job, I pay my taxes, I put a little money aside for retirement, I'm doing everything the government is telling me so that when I get to 65, 70, whatever, I'm going to live a good life and not be worried, that's not going to fucking happen. Okay, so you need to, you need to actually be more ready because when, shit like this happens the government is going to discuss it forever they may or may not give you financial aid they may or may not help you and not only that they're going to put you in a confinement in your house and then good luck you know so it makes you reflect about how inefficient for if it was a company it's like how inefficient mm -hmm. this is and also companies you know they're not ready because they don't have this kind of uh, 
uh, emergency plan in place for this situation. So uh, an emergency is because you don't expect it. Especially big companies. Right. Small right. businesses, it's like, okay, I, I get it. You right. know, like it's hard to start a small business. Most small businesses, yeah, are literally paycheck to paycheck in their own right, right? But big businesses, if you're a multi-billion dollar corporation, right. you have no excuse. But but the thing is that we are in, in the U.S. where our, our economy is 65-70% consumer economy. So guess what? You kill the consumers, yeah. you kill your economy. That was going to be another point I made. Exactly. That I think this hopefully will shift us back more towards a production economy rather than a pure consumer-based economy. And I don't mean necessarily production just on like manufacturing. I don't think we need all the manufacturing to come back. I think some will. Well, I think we need but, to rethink that. But I think seriously. that I think that a consumer-based economy is, as you said, fragile in its nature. It's because you rely so much on the goods and services of other countries to stay afloat. And then when that disappears, you're so, screwed. So in that sense, let me ask you, do you think this, let, let's just start finishing it up the, the podcast, but I want to think more positively about this situation. So I actually was thinking, you're talking about reflection stuff. I was thinking, you know, as, as much as it hurts to think about this now, I think in the long run, this situation, this coronavirus crisis could be a good wake-up call for the U.S., for all countries, but specifically for the U.S., to say, hey, we want to be anti-fragile, which is something that we always uh, say here. Um, we need to be more self-sufficient. Because the reason why we're not self-sufficient is because everything, not everything, but majority of the products in the U.S. are made in China or overseas. Uh, Southeast Asia. Optimize for hyper efficiency. Right. And over. And profits too. So. Over. Yeah. We. we pro profits and efficiency over sustainability. Exactly. Exactly. And. But that, robustness. That hurts you in a situation where people are even saying this virus, this pandemic, I mean, it's, we've been predicting it forever. If it's not this, it's that or whatever. It could happen again or whatever. So. But I think. It, to me, the, the critical thing is that they say, okay, well, we need to we need to more masks or more respirators or more something, and we don't have a fucking place in the U.S. that can make those masks. Okay, now we're actually um, asking uh, Elon Musk to in his Giga factory or in his factory in Fremont for the cars that is manufacturing respirators and all that stuff. We don't have a freaking fucking factory in the U.S. Even Apple, with all their power and cash and all that stuff, cannot generate anything because everything that Apple does is made in China. Okay, yeah, designed in Palo Alto, whatever shit, but in manufacturing in China. So even Apple, the richest company in the U.S., if not now or whatever, cannot manufacture shit because they don't have a factory here. Okay, so uh, the auto manufacturers, traditional ones, are all shut down. GM, Ford, all well, that stuff. Well, GM is making... Um, GM is making, yeah. Uh, are they making ventilators? What are they Yeah, make? ventilators something. or something, right. So, so... <laughs> But that's the thing, that we realize that everything that is manufacturing is going away. Yeah, especially, especially essential services like or, or goods like drugs we right. were talking about. Uh, yeah, like I, I pharmacy. Think one thing that should be in place as far as regulations go, just in the same way that we have regulations on banks, where on a bank, okay, you have to have a certain amount of cash reserves right. versus the money you're lending out. Uh, pharmaceutical companies should have to manufacture a certain percentage of all of their drugs in the U.S. That's why That's why I was thinking that in the long run, if we're smart, as far as company owners, CEOs, and all of us, we should say, you know what? In an ideal situation, we, we, we produce, manufacture, and consume our products here, yeah, with a few exceptions, but that is the exception more than the rule whether it's clothing or whatever, or pharmaceutical products or any type of supply chain, we can, when this happens, we can shut down the country completely and say, you know what? The rest of the world may be in a pandemic. We don't have any flights coming in. We don't have people coming in. We don't have anything. We shut the country and we're not affected at all. And by the okay? way, pandemic is what's causing it this time. But next time it could be something else. Right, exactly. And so... Like, it's like the whole trade war with China. It's exactly. Like, okay, exactly. this wouldn't happen. We were talking the about this on The whole reason there's a trade war right. is because they own us as far as manufacturing. Exactly, exactly. So, so if we stop that and we say, you know what? We're going to tell companies or companies to realize that, yeah, you're gonna, it's going to cost you more. Maybe you sell an iPhone for 1000 bucks, and instead of making 600 or 700 profit or whatever, you're going to make... 
300, that's still pretty good profit, okay? But you are more self-sufficient. You can manufacture here. You have full control of your assembly chain all the way to production and, and distribution and selling. And if we, in the long run, realize that we have more employment, more manufacturing in the U.S., more jobs in the U.S., less dependency from the other countries, and then when situations like this happen, like whether it's trade wars, pandemics, wars, whatever, we can isolate ourselves, a full country confinement, and then we say, fine, we're going to be here. We don't need anything from the rest of the world. The only thing that will be affected is tourism because we're not going to allow people to fly into our country for 90 days until you guys heal yourself, which is no different than don't come to work if you are sick. And then we're going to continue to our, our life normally. So you know? let me ask you, because my, I have kind of two viewpoints and one is very optimistic and idealistic, and I hope this is what happens. But the other part of me is like, I don't know. And my idealistic viewpoint is that people will really learn from this. And as you're saying, like on the consumer individual side, people will say, you know what? I don't need to be so materialistic. I can. I need to make sure that I have savings and a security net for myself before I go out and buy that new car, buy that new purse, buy that new sh pair of shoes, whatever, right? Those non-essential things, basically, that maybe people will finally decide, you know what, I need to worry more I about understand. saving money. The second, uh... On companies, same thing. Hey, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't take out debt to buy back shares. Maybe we shouldn't do that, right? That everyone across the board will be more responsible and that's and less, and less uh, hyper-consumerist, I should say. My other this kind of more cynical viewpoint, and I hope this is in the case, is that a lot of times people just don't learn and that maybe this will be over and in a year from now people are just like back to well, their same old ways. I, I, uh, I and I don't know. I, mean, I hope it's my idealistic way is what happens. No, I mean, I, I know. I mean, I could, if I were to bet money, which I'm not a, I don't like to bet. But anyways, I would say that we will remember this. We, we have short-term memory. That's my fear. And, and uh, we will, the same thing happened during the recession uh, to 12 years ago now, um, everybody said, yeah, we need to do this. The the average household debt went down. Or maybe everybody was living within their means. Their credit card debt was down. And then if you remember the mortgages, the delinquencies, all that stuff. And then all of a sudden, the average debt kept creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. And then it went back to pretty much normal. The rules were changed. I mean, you want to buy a house. Yeah, you need to have but 20%. I think my, my argument for the optimistic, idealistic viewpoint is that I think the last 10 years are not, we're like almost, we're, we're not a reflection of reality. And I think that the reason I said that I thought this recession was coming within the next couple of years anyways is because the economy wasn't actually so good and the world wasn't actually booming. It was just artificially inflated. Well, well, well. And my optimistic viewpoint is that it, when you look at what they call the greatest generation, which is the generation that was basically went through the Great Depression and then World War II and won World War II, that's what they call the greatest generation before the baby boomers. They went through the Great Depression and learned. And people, it's a famous thing that it, people who lived through the Great Depression they were incredibly right. self-aware, self, uh, not self-conscious is not the right word, but basically responsible, yeah, fiscally. They remember. Every, they remember. They didn't forget that. They they were like that for the rest of their lives. Yeah, and now and it's think, basically, that was 100 years ago, 90 yes, years ago, and so I people think, forget. And I think, obviously, people will remember. But so I, do you think it'll be another... 2009 where okay in a year from now everybody's back to normal because really people didn't change their behaviors I don't, I don't think it's going to happen in a year from now or do you think it'll be more like the greatest generation where now everyone is like oh no we really need to reflect and change our ways I, what I do think, you think yeah, I, no I think definitely it's not going to be a year and a year will probably not even be out of Two the years, uh, recession years. whatever but as time goes by things will start softening and people will forget because you think people will forget that's human nature and as Older generations will always be more and more cautious, but the younger generations will basically say, "Oh yeah, yeah but whatever." I'm, but the greatest but I, generation, I think I'm more, I'm, I'm, I'm not so They concerned. went through when they were in their twenties and thirties. Yes, so I'm not talking. I, I understand, but it was a different era. There was less communication. There was less um, everything. I mean, less. So progress you think and you're else. taking the, the more cynical of like mm, people? Are no, it's not cynical. This. It's just it's just basically human psychology. I mean, I, I always give the analogy of. I'm driving down the road and I'm going or on the freeway and I go over 
75 miles per hour and all of a sudden i'm going 80 85 whatever and i see a cop that pulls over behind me and he's like oh it's coming i was like oh fuck and then he's like okay shit i'm not gonna do it again why did i do this blah blah, blah. points on my license blah 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 blah. And then all of a sudden the cop pulls over and keeps going forward he's not pulling me over and it's not for me and i'm like oh thank goodness blah blah blah. you know it's great and i go continue at the speed limit for the next 10 miles and then after a while it's like back to 85 because no, I, I know what you're saying. You know, I, that that's, with, that's my th- that happens with everything. I that's, hope that's just that human nature. We tend to I forget these things. I hope we're wrong, though. I know, but I hope more than us individuals. That's what we live in a place in a but, government. I'm more relying on. I'm hoping that governments around yeah, the world. But, well, I know, I know that's very idealistic, but that's why you have governments. That but, there's things that are at the macro level that you cannot take care of yourself. Right. You know, now, if I'm a restaurant owner. Like I said, I'm going to start taking care of things and maybe keep costs at bay. As a business owner, yes, but as an individual, it's a little different. No, you know? but what people cannot, the average person who says, what can I take away from this? I mean, one thing is, yes, you can say, oh, I, I changed my mind on certain economic policies or something. And so when I go to vote, I'm going to vote for people who have whatever, right? But on an individual basis, someone listening to this he says, okay, okay, yeah, so but, now but maybe- I... I think I think the lesson from this should be, hey, we really should try to rely on the government as little as possible. I understand. But and that on an individual basis, because if everyone takes from this, they say, you know what? If everyone in, in the U.S. And, and maybe the rest of the world, too, says, you know what? Fuck the government in terms of I'm not I don't want my livelihood to be reliant on the efficiency of the government because that has clearly failed time and time again. And I'm gonna make sure that I'm okay so that even if everything else is crumbling, I'll be fine. And I hope that that's the but approach people take. Because people... that's, that's all you have control over. I understand, you can only control I understand yourself. David, but you just said... So what do you think? People should just say, fuck it, doesn't matter? No, 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 that's not it. Uh, I have no hope. No, I'm no. a victim, I'm done. Okay. I mean, that's basically what you're saying. I don't know. No, I don't understand no. your what point. I'm, what I'm saying is that people will forget. You just said that last week you're going out and people were still in restaurants. That's when we have the news 24 7 and people are still I going out to more, restaurants. I think that's more denial. Well, they haven't I know. forgotten whatever anything. It, no, whatever it is, denial or whatever you want to call it. But the fact of the matter is that when we heard about this situation that was getting serious, you and I chose to be confining ourselves, even though we don't have that lockdown in arizona just yet for now but i haven't really been going out to any restaurants or anything for the last three weeks other than going to buy food or um buy something essential or something for the most part i've been just so, working and doing stuff that's because i made that choice i said my health for me as I always said is my number one asset without health i'm fucking shit so i'm investing in my health and if that takes me to be home for three days that's what i'm gonna do now some people with all the information they have with their office being locked down with kids not at school or whatever they're still going out to restaurants all that stuff but the difference is here's what, here's the difference people haven't felt at that point hadn't felt the pain yet People are starting to feel the pain now. Okay, yeah. but So you don't think people will learn the lesson? I think people will learn the lesson and then forget the lesson. Okay, well, then that's not learning the lesson. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's... You don't think this will be basically, like I said, where the people who went through the Great Depression changed their behaviors for life? Yes. You don't think that's going to happen? I don't think this is going to cause people... To change their, I mean, you don't think thirty percent unemployment and the biggest GDP loss the U.S. has ever seen in the country's history is going to change things. I think the people that are going to be changed are the people I mean, that are actually thirty percent unemployment. Okay, let me finish. I think you're asking me my opinion. Okay, but if I give you my opinion, don't get upset. But I'm telling you that I think people that were I'm just trying op- to take the more optimistic view. No, I'm telling you, it's optimistic. I'm telling you that people that are being affected personally. Whether they um, were laid off and lost their jobs, or they lost a relative or family person, I know people that lost their uncle or their uh, or their mother or something. Those guys will remember forever. Now, the people that said, "Oh fuck, that pandemic was a fucking pain in the ass. I was locked in my house for a month." I mean, you you go to Twitter and people are like, "I'm running out of uh, ideas. I just don't know what to do." The people that are hiding, that hiring pets to go out and um, for a walk or something. There's people that are going to do that and they're going to take this like a fucking pain in the ass for like a month or whatever, and then they're going to go out with their lives as usual. Because that's just people, okay? They're, are, call them irresponsible, call them whatever. It doesn't matter. Why do people do things all the time that are not good or not approved or whatever? Uh, you have people that go to the beach and they get drunk and they don't give a shit and they're doing stuff. They're, oh, fuck coronavirus, whatever. 
uh, yeah, those people are uh, fucking stupid, but they're going to continue to be stupid. So unfortunately, humanity is a huge, huge spectrum, and you cannot just say people will do this. People Not will everybody. Do that. Not everybody but that went through a society will move a different course. Yes, maybe. Like I said, uh, if we have solutions, and then people would like to think what well, is the easy path and say, oh yeah, well the government learned from these things, so I'm sure it's going to be taken care of next time. You think so? You think people are going to have tr more trust in the government after this? Because I, I definitely don't no, think so. No, no, it's not government trust or anything. It's just basically saying there's going to be, uh, I say the government as, as the medical institutions, the hospitals, they're going to have more masks ready. They're going to have more of this. They're going to create a vaccine, whatever. I think as time goes by, this will be, uh, how, we had this, the, the, the Spanish flu over a hundred, almost a hundred years ago or more than a hundred years ago now. We had the H1N1. Okay, that was just uh, maybe 10, 14 years ago. But that didn't shut down the world. That started actually here, by the way. Okay, That, that didn't shut down the world. Okay, but it affected the U.S. pretty severely. Okay, right, but it didn't shut everything down. Okay, I'm that's saying fine. this is different. And the, the swine flu that we called it was basically starting in porks and stuff, and it was affecting everybody. I mean, it was it was the closest thing that we have to now, even though it didn't affect the rest of the world. And trust me, people are knowing that it affects the rest of the world, but they don't give a fuck about the rest of the world. They give a fuck about themselves. And yes. as much as I care that a lot of people are dying in Italy, I care about the companies that I we're working with that are not able to continue open because they had to lay off their employees. That affects us more personally. But that's you know, I, mean. I have no I control mean, over what happens. So you don't think that companies and individuals are going to start being more responsible after this and saying, okay, we fucked up. We got to, on an individual basis and on a company leadership basis saying, we need to make sure that we really are prepared for a rainy day. I'll be very happy if the companies resort to do something like that and especially moving some manufacturing to their own countries. Forget about being in the US, but yeah, no, France I France in France, Spain in Spain, whatever. Yeah, you have some cooperation or something, but you also have enough that you produce yourself so that you're not reliant on other countries. Because frankly... We're talking about climate change and all that stuff. We never got China to sign any agreements or do anything. Do you think globalism is going to go back a bit? There's going to be more. I mean, if anything, I think um, governments and companies will learn that they need to be much more self-sufficient or at least have a plan B for situations like this. Whatever the plan B is for each company depends on the company. But they have to have a strategy for these situations okay we have a lot of strategies in the country for war times okay if we have a threat for any country or from any country we have situations in place with different defcon levels and other stuff that are specifically defined on okay, how I'm to saying act on a, i'm talking uh, more but on we don't have it for basis. the economy i'm talking on more on an individual basis because people cannot control People have very little influence over what the government does, but they have complete control for the most part over their okay, own lives. So, so what what should individuals take from this? Because that's ultimately, the, if all what, of the individuals make a change in their life, then as a whole, society will change. But that's all people can really control. I understand. Well, I mean, so, so I don't do you know. Think I don't individuals know. will make real changes to their behavior. I, I can tell you, I, I don't know. I mean, all I know is that from my experience from um, the last recession that we have as far as but financially. But what I'm saying is I don't think the last recession was it, it, the same as this. This no, is just so different. I know it's different because this is more more tsunami type, more, more sudden. But the actual effect that it's having now, aside from health effects, is the financial effect that people are losing their jobs, okay? Yeah. And losing income and, and even all that more stuff. so than the last recession. Yes. That's more, what I'm saying. More sudden than the last recession. And, and more but severely. Also, but the stimulus package is also more than the last recession. Last recession, the total package was like 1.4 trillion. Now we're already at 2.5 and we're even finished. Yeah, well. Okay? But anyways, my point is that the last recession was the worst thing that had happened since the Great Depression. Okay, we're talking 1920s versus 2008-9. So, so did people learn from that for a couple of years? Do you think this will be worse than the last recession? As far as the, the situation? I mean, worse in which way? Basically, more unemployment longer term. I th no. M more I think, GDP shrinkage. Mm, I, I already gave you my opinion last week. I think this will be more severe short term, faster recovery long term. That's my opinion. 